Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Gerhard Kasper, and I'm the president of the American Academy in Berlin. Uh, if you have seen a fair number of people with little gadgets in their ear, I will disclose to you they are security people, and they are not here to protect you, but the ambassador. Uh, uh, who, who is very who is very well worth protecting because he's a former student of mine and I'd like all my former students to be protected. <laughs> uh, I welcome you to the Foreign Policy Forum which is uh, supported by Daimler and we are going to have a wonderful and interesting talk tonight, I guarantee that, by Steve Krasner. Now, there is no way I can refer to Steve Krasner as Professor Krasner, though he is of course that. Indeed, he is the Graham H. Stewart Professor of International Relations at Stanford and a senior fellow at the Freeman Spokely Institute for International Studies and also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Steve and I have been colleagues for 24 years and friends for most of that period. No, 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 you are getting it wrong. I, <laughs> I am not suggesting uh, that we were enemies at the beginning, but simply that when I served as president of the university, it was difficult to forge new friendships. Though I did view Steve always as friendly, by which I mean that we were and are pretty much in sync when it comes to views about higher education and what a university should primarily be about. The good old Chicago views, John. Until 1991, Steve had been chair of the political science department. And when I came to Stanford from the University of Chicago in 1992, Steve had begun to work on what became perhaps his most influential book, published by Princeton in 1999 under the title Sovereignty Organized Hypocrisy. One of the reviewers had this to say about the book. Stephen Krasner played a key role in transforming state sovereignty from a neo-realist presumption into an object of sustained inquiry. Keeping different kinds of sovereignty straight is crucial to the study of international relations, whether at the hands of neo-realists or constructivists, neo-liberal institutionalists, or postmodernists. If you have a great sense of what all of these labels mean, please let me know afterwards. <laughs> I emphasize the book on sovereignty because as Steve was writing it, he gave me portions to read and to react to. It is rare in the life of a university president that his faculty colleagues actually consult him on matters relevant to their own field of scholarship. <laughs> Thus, you can understand that I criticized his draft with enthusiasm. <laughs> in an interview some years ago, Steve was asked about the subtitle of the book, Organized Hypocrisy. The interviewer said, I was struck by the subtitle. It struck me that was a term that you could apply to international politics generally. Is that a fair conclusion, or does that subtitle, Organized Hypocrisy, belong only to sovereignty? To which Steve responded, not just to international relations, to life. <laughs> that is typical Krasner. He is indeed a realist when it comes to all matters human. According to Steve, the most important argument in the book, an empirical claim, is that the two big rules of sovereignty, which are, he likes to say, the Westphalian-Vitalian rule. Now, I have to pause here. 
the entire world understands that sovereignty is defined by the Westphalian rule. If you want to seem sophisticated, if you want to appear like Henry Kissinger, you drop the word Westphalian sovereignty ever so often, and people will immediately pay attention to you. Uh, now, uh, Steve actually believes uh, uh, that there is some justification for linking it to the peace of Westphalia, but Vattel, the great Swiss international lawyer, was really the inventor of Westphalian sovereignty, and therefore he has hyphened it. Uh, the rule is, of course, that states have autonomy and that other states must not intervene. That is what sovereignty is all about. And the rule of international legal sovereignty, which is to recognize judicially independent sovereign states. And he says they have been quite violated quite frequently, all of these rules, that's where the hypocrisy comes from, especially the Italian Westphalian sovereignty. Now, uh, Steve, uh, I, uh, I didn't mean to interfere. I um, had my nephew visit this weekend. He's a professor of law. Uh, his name is Casper, Matthias Casper. And he's a professor of law at the Westphalian Wilhelms Universität, named after William II, the emperor. And uh, of course, German universities are not immune to demands to rename things. We, we in the United States are presently going through an intensive period where you're supposed to rename everything at any of the major campuses. And I was pleased to learn this was not just an American phenomenon, but at the Westphalian Wilhelms Universität, they were also demanding renaming that university. But now comes the real charmer. What is it to be renamed? How is it going to be renamed? Westphalian Peace University. <laughs> I thought you would enjoy that. <laughs> unbeatable, unbeatable. Now, Steve attended Cornell as an undergraduate, joined the Peace Corps, and taught school at Nigeria, in Nigeria. For his MA and PhD, he went to Columbia and Harvard, respectively. And before Stanford, he has, uh, where he has been since 1981, he taught at Harvard and UCLA. He has engaged in public service, both at the university, where he has held various important administrative positions, and in the US government, where most recently, that is from 2005 to 2007, he served as director of policy planning in the State Department. There, as well as in his scholarship since, weak states and the topic of state stabilization have been major concerns. It is this topic that Steve will address tonight. Now, I should mention one other distinction before I sit down. When at Cornell, as an undergraduate, Steve was elected to Quill and Dagger, a senior honor society that seeks to recognize exemplary uh, undergraduates at Cornell University who have shown leadership, character, and dedication to service. I am not sure what the name Quill and Dagger is meant to suggest. <laughs> Quill as an ancient writing instrument makes a lot of sense, and Steve has certainly been heavily engaged in the activity of writing. But as far as I know, he has never daggered anybody. <laughs> other than perhaps metaphorically. Thus, physically, you have nothing to fear from him. And even intellectually, Steve is generally, though somewhat less reliably, a mild-mannered person. Steve. <laughs> What, what can I say, Gara? Thank you for that lovely, lovely introduction. This is something that, of course, those of you that are familiar with the United States know never happens in the United States, where somebody kind of pulls out three sentences that they found on the internet, reads them whether they're outdated or not, and that's it. And then you have to say thank you for that lovely introduction, but that really, that really was a lovely introduction. 
All right, so that was a very German thing. So I want to start this lecture on theories of state building also with something that I wouldn't dare actually to do in the US and is also at least kind of a Berlin thing. All right, you don't have to say anything out loud, but I want you in your heads to rank these things in chronological order from the oldest to the most recent. I'll give you 30 seconds. You can write it down or not, or you can pretend you got it right. All right, so here's the, um, that's the actual, that's the actual real order. So I, I think there's one thing that's kind of obviously to be noted from this, and I, I have to say, if I can go back for a second, I do think that Nefertiti is one of the most extraordinary pieces ever produced by human beings, but I was really shocked. I mean, this number one um, is an even older piece, a thousand years before Nefertiti, uh, also in the uh, Berlin Museum. Uh, so, and what, what's pretty clear is that if you think about or look at human art, um, there's nothing like a linear progression. I was actually in New York last week, and I took a couple of pictures from the Whitney Museum, which is a nice building, but 20th century American art leaves something to be desired. In you know, one of their galleries, the time period is, 19, is sort of 1910s to 1940s, as if the wars never happened, you know, and no distinction whatsoever. But if I'd actually decided to put a, another image here, um, it would make it even more vividly clear, I think, that we're not in a world in which we, we can think of things uh, moving in some kind of linear progressive way. But I would say that when we think about international relations um, and think about failed or failing and badly governed states, the general kind of assumption that we make, often unstated, is that somehow there's a way to put these countries on the path to Denmark, or maybe now the path to Norway, or to some ideal consolidated democratic, ideally social democratic system. Empirically, um, the number of countries that have actually been in the OECD world, and it's not even all countries that are, in, that are members of the OECD, is an extremely small number of countries, maybe around 30, for a relatively short period of time. And we th if we think about the 100,000 years, or even the 10,000 years, or even the last 2,000 years of human history, in only a very small number of places, um, have we gotten to, OK, settings like this. You know, sitting in this beautiful room, looking at the Vance, thinking about how gorgeous this is. Of course, everything that happened you know, in this area, I mean, wasn't so gorgeous if we even go back in my lifetime. But we think about the OECD world as somehow the natural order of things and somehow a kind of teleological endpoint towards which there's some kind of natural evolution. All right, what's pretty clear over the last 200 years is that this natural evolution hasn't taken place. So if you go back to 1800, um, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the biggest gaps in per capita income are about one to four. Um, and if you go back a little earlier than that, it's very clear that the most technologically advanced place in the world was China um, and not Western Europe. The Metropolitan Museum of Art had um, an exhibit two years ago of, of the textile trade, 1500 to 1800, and I tried to actually look at every piece in the exhibit, and there were, I'm not sure I saw every one, but there were several hundred. There was one single piece of clothing that went from Europe to, to Asia. And that was a woolen garment that um, a Japanese samurai would wear under their armor. Everything else went in the other direction. Over the course of the last 200 years, you have had these huge gaps opening in the world, which this, um, this graph makes vividly clear. Gerhard mentioned that I was in the Peace Corps in Nigeria, which is true. Um, I was in a place called Yola. Yola is now one of the major refugee centers for refugees from Boko Haram. Uh, so this was an area I was there in the early 1960s, and I, without doubt that my colleagues and I, and my colleagues being Nigerians and Brits as well as Americans, 
would never have guessed that the area that we were working in would have been riven by a very brutal and primitive um, fundamentalist movement, which has killed very, very large numbers of people. So whatever you can say about Yola, Nigeria, um, it certainly isn't moving in some linearly better direction uh, over the course of the last 50 years. All right, so the question then is if we think about state development, how can we explain this variation uh, that's apparent from uh, the earlier slide? And I want to begin this talk by saying there are three major candidates which are certainly there in the academic literature um, and I would say are in the heads of at least American policymakers, although sometimes in an implicit way. And the three candidates are modernization theory, um, theories about institutional capacity, and theories about elite bargaining and competition or rational choice theories. Okay, the first two are in people's heads and widely available. The last one is in the heads of American academics, especially American economists and political scientists, and basically not in anyone else's head, although I actually think it's a theoretical approach which is most insightful. Um, if we get, begin with modernization theory, I mean, this is a theory that so arguments go back, I mean, at least to the 19th century, certainly to Marx and Weber. And here you can see you're sitting in a situation in Europe where the Industrial Revolution is making manifestly dramatic changes in people's lives, maybe overall for the good, but certainly in very mixed ways. But it is a theory which says essentially that all good things go together. That if you can only find your way to the up escalator, like this happy couple, you'll continue to ride the up escalator all the way to Norway, even Norway without oil. Um, so once you have technological change, which is the basic driving force in this theory, um, if you combine technological change with population growth, you get higher levels of income, you get higher levels of income, you get a larger middle class, you have a larger middle class, you have a, a, a fundamental set of attitudes and a population um, which is conducive to consolidated democracy. That's the basic argument. So the escalator basically keeps going up here. The problem is you have to find your way to the bottom rung. And the argument here is very heavily based on this notion of the role of the middle class, changes in middle class attitudes, um, having a set of people that's more highly educated, that's more individually motivated, that's more rational. We were just having a discussion at dinner, which I mean, I've had many times over the last several months, which is it's very clear in the presidential debates that if Clinton and Trump are the American candidates, that Clinton will be manifestly more effective in discussing issues. What's not clear is whether this is going to make any difference. Now, if you believe in modernization theory, you will think that it will matter, um, and matter in decisive ways. So this is a very well worked out theory. It's been very thoroughly studied. And there is um, a fair amount of evidence in support of this theory, although um, not every piece of evidence supports the theory. The most important piece of evidence, the most important study that I've seen in support of modernization theory is an article written by Carlos Bosch, Carlos Bosch uh, who's a political scientist at Princeton, which appeared in the American Political Science Review in 2011. And Bosch looked at the relationship between per capita income and, and levels of democratization from 1800 to 2000, and concluded that there was a very close relationship with two exceptions. One exception is once you reach a fairly kind of medium high level of income, $10,000 per capita, the relationship breaks down. So getting richer once you've reached $10,000 doesn't necessarily mean that you'll become more democratic, but at lower income levels, it does mean that there's a tight relationship between per capita income and democracy. Secondly, uh, the relationship breaks down during the Cold War period. And Bosch's explanation, which I think is entirely compelling, is that the two superpowers during the Cold War had no interest in democratization. Obviously, the Soviet Union didn't have an interest, but the Americans didn't have an interest either. The primary American concern was, are we going to have guys in place, essentially, that will vote for us in the UN, and that will somehow call themselves something other than communist? 
So both the Americans and the Soviet Union frustrated movements that modernization theory argues would naturally have taken place during this period of rising income. If you think modernization pure theory is right, you should sleep very comfortably when you think about China. This is a theory that clearly predicts that as Chinese income goes up, you'll have a larger Chinese middle class. As you have a larger Chinese middle class, you'll have more demands on the government for effective and fair governance, and you will have a transition to democracy. It's a very clear, unambiguous prediction. However, not all of the empirical data um, is entirely consistent with modernization theory. So there are two kind of um, factoids, you might say, which, which are really consistent. One is that there is a very weak relationship between income levels, per capita income, and transitions from autocratic to democratic regimes. And there's quite a bit of shifting in the world between these two types. It's not that you get to be a democracy and you just stay here. Countries shift back and forth, and the transition doesn't seem to be related um, to levels of per capita income. Second, there is no relationship between um, the longevity of autocratic regimes and income levels. And this, if this is the case, and empirically it is the case, it would suggest that we can't be so confident about China. Um, income levels may go up, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have some transition to a democratic regime. So modernization theory has been very well studied. It's a theory that's widely understood, not just in academia. It's certainly a theory that has guided the work of most development agencies that was certainly dominant in the work of the World Bank, at least before 1990 and maybe before 2000. And there is a lot of empirical support for it. All right, but it's not the only theory that is available. So second theory, theories about institutional capacity. So Hobbes, and this is basically an argument which says, if you don't have security and order, you cannot have anything else. Um, and security and order are not necessarily so easy to come by. Hobbes is obviously the or source for this theory. I mean, Hobbes publishes the Leviathan in 1648. You've had an English Civil War, you've just had the Thirty Years' War in Germany, which kills two and a half million people, more people on a per capita basis than were killed in Europe before any war except uh, until, up until World War I. Uh, so Hobbes is looking at this world, and Hobbes is trying to convince you of one single thing in the Leviathan, which is that you must obey the sovereign. That revolt and rebellion are illegitimate. The, um, ex the Hobbes gives the people a little bit of a way out that if you're actually fighting, you can sometimes be so alarmed at the thought of losing your life that you might run away. But aside from that, you're supposed to obey the sovereign. Uh, Gerhard and I, I mean, did something which was extremely valuable to me. Um, I don't know how valuable it was for him. We taught a course on citizenship together for a number of years. And one of the things we looked at is the contrast between Hobbes and Locke, which for me, was extremely enlightening because Locke does say, well, you don't, if you're the sovereign, you don't get a totally free ride. You can do things that are so bad that people have the right to revolt. The clearest modern exponent of this theory is Samuel Huntington. Samuel Huntington wrote a book in 1968 called Political Order and Changing Societies. And here, I have to be a little solipsistic. So I was a PhD student at Harvard. And Harvard and MIT had this faculty seminar called JOSPOD, Joint Seminar on Political Development. And if you were a graduate student, you like, and this was a very Harvard thing, which doesn't actually happen in the same way at Stanford. I mean, you prayed that they would invite you so you could sit at the edge of the table and listen to the great men talk. But what was so striking was that this was a period when Seymour Martin Lipset who was probably the most important modern, modern exponent of, of modernization theory was at Harvard. Uh, Daniel Lerner, who was at, was at MIT. And pretty much modernization theory was like it. It's what everybody accepted and thought was clearly what was going to happen. And it's also a period in the early and mid 1960s, right after decolonization, where everyone thought, well, things would be great. I mean, Yola in 
1964 might not have been so terrific, but if you'd asked, we would have all said, me and my colleagues, that by, I mean, 1975, or at least 1990, it surely will be terrific. Um, what Huntington argued was, in the, in the book, and he summarized his argument really in a kind of uh, an equation, which was social mobilization without political institutionalization leads to political decay. All of these people that are becoming more literate and moving to cities in the third world are going to produce chaos and not political development in the way that modernization theory pre predicted. Because they will make demands on the society which the society and polities are not able to actually effectively respond to. So you can get on the up escalator here, but you can tumble all the way down. That's a basic argument of institutional capacity. Things can get better, but they can also definitely get worse. All right, the big challenge for institutional capacity is to understand where institutional capacity comes from. Uh, since there are clearly places that end up in chaos and disorder. And th here there are a bunch of arguments, and there's no consensus within the academic literature. And I've kind of pulled out here everything that I've ever discovered. So the most common argument is war makes a state and the state makes war. This is an aphorism um, that was uh, attributed, not attributed, but I really, I think, articulated by Charles Tilley who is a political sociologist, um, one of Ira Katznelson's uh, colleagues, for a long period of time. Um, and Tilly worked mainly on Europe, and Tilly basically said, look, if you're here, and he meant here in the middle of Europe, you're sitting here, and you know, it's pretty flat. I flew to Warsaw two weeks ago, it's pretty flat. Um, if you don't want to get overrun by somebody, you better develop an effective set of political and especially military institutions. And Tilly argued that to do that effectively, you had to develop both coercion and capital. You had to be able to have a coercive apparatus, and you needed to have a, a fiscal system that would allow the monarch to do that effectively. Now, of course, Tilly and his colleagues also realized that, I mean, things actually in Prussia worked the way they were supposed to. Uh, if you looked at Poland, which is basically sitting in the same place, it didn't turn out so great, and Poland disappears from the map of Europe um, for uh, more than 100 years. Same argument, my colleague Frank Fukuyama has made exactly the same argument about China. So China goes through a period of civil war, 300 years, ending in 221 BC, with the consolidation of a single dynasty, at which point you also have the beginning of this Chinese mandarinate system. So there again, and the Chinese were able to mobilize very impressive portions of the population, much more impressive than the por portions of populations that were mobilized um, in Europe. So this war makes a state and the state makes war is also an argument that looks like it can explain, you know, why you had this effective state development in China really 2,000 years before you begin to have it in Europe. Um, this image here is from McGregor. Is that this, the guy who's head of the Deutsche Historische Museum now? Um, so this was in his book. Uh, this was 100 illustrations of... Humboldt. 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 He's head of the Humboldt. No, he's an advisor. Neil McGregor. Yeah, the guy who's a museum director came from the British... Okay, so this is from his book. So this is the first um, actual... Um, picture that we have of a human ruler. And this is a picture of King Den in Egypt in 3000 BC. And you can see how he's maintaining order. You're basically beating people over the head. Uh, so war makes the state and the state makes war is an old argument, one that's familiar to us and is an explanation for state capacity. Um, there are other arguments, so I'll give you a few of them. I mean, they're certainly less prominent in the literature. Um, one is an argument about social coalitions. That is, when you begin to have a larger middle class, the middle class begins to put demands on the state um, for a more effective pattern of governance. This is an argument that's been made about early modern Europe. It's an argument that's been made in the contemporary world about Somaliland, which is this small piece of Somalia, which is actually operating, working pretty effectively in the northeast corner of the country. And it's certainly the most prominent argument for the development of something like an effective state in the United States in the last part of the 19th century. At the beginning of the 19th century, there basically is hardly any federal government in the United States. 
Um, it's a it's a political system that's based on courts and parties. The United States fights a civil war. 700,000 people are killed, very high level of mobilization. And then kind of re- looks like it's going to return back to the kind of corruption, corrupt parochial system of government that it had in the past. And the argument that this is really reversed by having a larger, more educated middle class that demands more from the government. And this is very consistent with modernization theory. There are arguments that state capacity comes from colonialism. Um, A very prominent example of this is Korea, where the argument, which is Koreans hate, is that Japanese colonialism actually made a big difference because the Japanese introduced land reform um, and also introduced industrialization. I mean, it was in in North Korea at that time. Um, And that actually paved the way for the very impressive performance of South Korea in the post-war period. South Korea is the only, the only large country that's actually dramatically changed its rank order. In the post-World War II period, everybody's gotten kind of gradually richer. In the 1950s, South Korea's per capita income was at the same level as West Africa. South Korea is now an OECD country. Its per capita income is, I think, in the mid-20,000s. And if you've been to Seoul, it's a truly impressive place. But it is a very, very unusual accomplishment. Uh, Third argument um, are arguments about religious beliefs. Um, My colleague, Gan Frank Fukuyama, has, I think, an extremely clever and, uh, as far as I know, original argument about why you had more effective checks and balances in Europe than in other parts of the world. And his argument is that Europe is the only area of the world in which you have a religious authority hierarchically organized, which is separate and distinct from secular authority. So, I mean, Henry IV goes to Canossa in the snow. It didn't always work out so, you know, exactly that the Pope always won, but there was certainly some check on secular authority in Europe. In other parts of the world, the Islamic world, secular and religious authority are conjoined. Um, in South Asia, you do have a separate religious class of Brahmins, but they're not hierarchically organized. In China, you don't really have a separate religion. So Fukuyama argues that this was an advantage that existed in Europe, the separation of secular and religious authority with a, with a religious authority that could at least to some extent check secular authority. It was an advantage that you didn't have in other parts of the world. Um, there's an argument about the Prussian bureaucracy which is kind of right out of Weber, which is is an argument by Gorski, who's um, a sociologist at Yale, that one of the things that the Prussian monarchy did in in the 17th century was to recruit Calvinists. And you recruited Calvinists for the same reason that Weber thought Calvinists were great. They were kind of internally compelled to do the right thing and weren't thinking about their own self-interest in the way that bureaucrats often do. And finally, one has to say that you can sometimes have exceptional leaders. Um, I thought this was, okay, you want to take a guess of what that is on the upper left, who that is? No, not Darth Vader. Could could have been the one Darth Vader was based on, though. (laughs) All right, so this is is a statue of Genghis Khan, which is in the middle of Ulaanbaatar. Um, which was established a- after communism ended, but I was struck by, you know, how much it's kind of modeled on the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> um, and when you go to the museum in Ulaanbaatar, what they emphasize is not that, you know, Genghis Khan overran all of Eurasia and killed a lot of people, um, but that he was uh, a, the initial lawgiver in this part of the world. Um, so the other two people I have there, Paul Kagame is the uh, distinguished looking guy in the, your lower right, president of Rwanda. Rwanda's done really very well. I mean, those life expectancies are better than life expectancies in surrounding countries. Um, the other person in the lower left, so I'll tell the story. This is um, the guy, his name is Nuhu Rabatu. He was the anti-corruption czar in Nigeria under Obasanjo, and in the end, Obasanjo fired him. He actually came from Yola, so there have only been two people I know that are famous that came from Yola. He's one, and the other guy is a guy named Abu Bakr, who was the vice president of Nigeria, uh, operated in the oil industry, and became a very wealthy man. But 
New Rubati, um, after he was forced out, um, spent some time in Washington and gave a few lectures in the United States. And he gave a lecture um, at Stanford several years ago in which he described a situation in which when he was the anti-corruption czar in Nigeria, somebody whom he was investigating came into his office, put a suitcase down on his desk. He opened the suitcase and there were $15 million in the suitcase. He said, I closed the suitcase and I took it to the prosecutor. And I was struck by two things. One was, I totally believed him. And two was, if someone put $15 million on a desk in front of me, I'm not really not exactly sure what I would do. <laughs> so there's certainly an argument that you can have exceptional leaders. And I think if we're concerned about public policy, this is a complicated problem because if you're a political leader in a Western democracy and you think that there's some chance of actually making countries work well, one thing that you try and do is find some good guy. I mean, the Americans have often tried to find good guys who spoke fluent English um, as a first criteria, but it's a kind of gives you in some ways in, too easy a way out. But we have to say there are individuals, and Paul Kagame is certainly an example of one, who's made a really significant difference uh, for their country. All right, so exceptional leaders may be another reason why you get institutional capacity. You know, the problem with exceptional leaders is there's the good emperors and the bad emperors. So you might have a good emperor, but you can also have bad emperors, and bad emperors can do very, very bad things. Um, and I should say, I mean, you should... Here, the basic idea in institutional capacity theory is you have to empower the state to maintain order. All right, here's the last contra-argument, rational choice institutionalism or elite bargaining. Uh, the basic argument here is that you need to focus on political elites. Political elites act in their own self-interest. Don't be deluded into thinking that you're going to have a world composed, uh, made up of Nuhu Rabatus or other political saints. Political leaders act strategically. Um, they have different interests. Political institutions must be constraining, not empowering. If political institutions are unconstrained, states will do what states have done basically throughout history. They will be either roving bandits or stationary bandits, but they will engage in rape, pillage, and extortion. That is what states do. That is what states have done throughout almost all of human history, to almost all of their population, with the exception of their brothers and sisters and maybe their cousins and uncles and aunts. Uh, so the key, the key insight of rational choice institutionalism is that you need to have an effective state. You need a state that's constrained. All right, the question is, how can you constrain the state? Uh, to do this, there has to be a self-enforcing bargain among elites. That is, elites have to see it as being in their interest to act in ways that benefit the society as a whole. That it's in their own self-interest to do that, uh, and also in the self-interest of the society as a whole. All right, in modern democracies, we, I mean, we more or less have that. Uh, people have to go out, they have to campaign politically, they have to get votes. If they want to hold political office, they have to have some set of policies that will be appealing to a majority or plurality of voters, regardless of the wide variety of, of institutional forms that we have. But the problem, of course, is how do you get to the point where you have a consolidated democracy, where people actually have to go out and campaign, as opposed to shooting their opponents or just ignoring the results of elections? Right, the basic argument, and this is not very satisfactory or comforting, I would say, if you're thinking of this problem from a policy perspective, is that this is pretty much a path-dependent process. There are random events that take place. They might or might not get locked in. There's no necessary teleology. And um, if you look at what I think is actually a great book, and I wouldn't usually recommend books, especially books of this length, but Asimov and Robinson is a great read from, from 2012. Um, and they talk about Britain, which is, of course, the first country that kind of achieves um, this open access, inclusive order. And they say, look, guys, don't think that this was foreordained. There was a lot of luck. You know, Magna Carta happened to work out okay. 
Um, you get the Black Death in Europe in the 14th century. It kills about 30% of the population. Labor becomes much more valuable because there's much less of it. Well, two things can happen that, in that situation. One is you become much more repressive because you don't want your laborers to be running away. The second is that labor might have a somewhat more, better bargaining position and might be able to consolidate some level of independence. And basically, the argument is because of relatively small differences in the situations of peasants in Western Europe versus serfs in Eastern Europe, the Black Death resulted in more repression in Eastern Europe and more independence in Western Europe. But small differences, haphazard, not predictable. Spanish Armada shows up off the uh, coast of England at the end of the 16th century. The British end up being victorious, in part because there was a very bad storm, which destroyed a lot of the Spanish ships. Weather had been a little different in that, whenever that was in 1588, instead of sitting here in this very nice place having had this very nice venison dinner, we'd all be out there digging potatoes or something worse. Um, but we never would have gotten to this modern consolidated democracy. Just a lot of luck and chance. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of the Glorious Revolution in, in England in 1688, clearly a product of European history in which you get a checks and balances between the monarchy on the one hand and the parliament on the other, something that can create a political system which is self-constraining that can then lead to the Industrial Revolution incredibly disruptive um, in Britain in a way that could never have taken place in an earlier period in time. In the, fifth, in the 1430s, the Chinese had a treasure fleet that was moving down the coast of East Africa. The ships were 10 times bigger than anything that the Europeans had. The emperor decided that the treasure fleet and all of the commercial activity that was taking place in coastal China was a threat to his regime. He recalled the treasure fleet. He burned it. And he forbade any ships being constructed in China that were larger than ships that you needed to conduct coastal trade. Okay, a different emperor with a somewhat different idea would have resulted in a situation which the Chinese would have discovered in Europe instead of the other way around. They were certainly in a better position to do it. So luck and happenstance is inherently um, an inherent part of this, this rational choice theory. All right, so those are the three big theories that are out there. Let me take just a few more minutes and say something about what I think is wrong with each of these theories and then what they imply. All right, modernization theory, the big problem here is that it cannot explain why economic growth occurs in the first place. Um, there's plenty of technological change around the world. Before 1800, it doesn't result in the Industrial Revolution. Um, th so, and that's a huge problem for modernization theory. If you think there's some automaticity from technological change in population growth to economic growth in a larger middle class and democracy, why didn't this, why didn't what happened in, in Greece or in Athens, um, why wasn't that the beginning instead of the beginning happening 2,000 years later? Um, institutional capacity theory, the big problem here, and this is the insight, I think, of rational choice institutionalism, it doesn't explain why if you have a strong state, the people in charge of that state, the political elite, won't act in their own self-interest, and their own self-interest is not very often going to coincide with the self-interest of the population as a whole. All right, rational choice institutionalism, all right, one obvious problem here is that it has no predictive ability whatsoever, and no one who's an adherent to the theory would claim that it did. Uh, I don't think that's as big a problem as the fact that rational choice institutionalism essentially bifurcates the world into open access orders and closed access orders, inclusive orders and exclusive orders. And if we look at the world, it's much messier than that. And there are probably about 60 states that we could comp confidently say are failed or failing. And there are about 30 states in the OECD world, but it looks like there's a lot of states in the middle. And it isn't obvious exactly how much light this theory throws on those other states. So Brazil is now suffering from this major um, corruption scandal, which has touched everyone. Um, and this Brazilian Senate has just voted to open an impeachment proceedings against Dilma Rousseff. But how should we understand that as a, a problematic thing in which we should just think about Brazil as a closed access state? 
That doesn't seem exactly right because they were doing so well for a while. Uh, or should we think of it as an open access order because there are clearly some people that are pursuing um, these prosecutions, these corruption charges, even though it's clearly pretty dangerous for them to be doing it. So there are a lot of states in the middle and institutional capacity theory, uh, rational choice institutionalism, I'm sorry, doesn't have any good way of dealing with those states in the middle. And that may really imply something if we're thinking about policy implications. All right, here's where I sort of come out on the policy side. I, I admit most of this is driven by thinking that rational choice institutionalism is the most persuasive theory that we have. But the other, but if you begin with the assumption that political actors are going to be self-interested, at least that's not inconsistent with modernization theory or with theories about institutional capacity. All right, if you think that what you need to do to be successful, that the sine qua non of success in badly governed places is that you have to adopt policies that the political elite will also embrace. That suggests that the kind of aspirations which you had in the Bush administration, which was basically uh, to put Afghanistan and Iraq on the path to consolidated democracy, are radically unrealistic. But it also might suggest that what's been embraced essentially by the Obama administration, if you read, I think, the very enlightening um, uh, interview which Obama had with Goldberg in The Atlantic, uh, very reflective um, and very lengthy, um, in which the basic conclusion is, you know, we can't do anything with these places, which is in this kind of Manichaean view of the world in which we can either transform it or it's just sinful, is certainly something which has characterized a big part of American history. I think there is, though, something that we can actually aim for that's realistic and achievable and would make things better for people living in countries that are in danger of state failure and also better for the rest of us. So, and that is good enough governance. That, that's a realistic thing to aim for. So, first, I think there are three things that you should try and do with good enough governance. First is security. Um, and here, this is a, it's a tricky problem. And, and developments in Egypt, I mean, make it very clear how tricky it is. So Mubarak is overthrown by basically street demonstrations, which the military isn't able, isn't willing to repress. You actually have the first free and fair election in Egypt, produces Morsi as a president. Morsi's overthrown by the military. Why? I, I, I'm sure that at least part of it was the military controls a substantial part of the Egyptian economy. And having a Muslim Brotherhood president in power threatened their position, their position, their status, and their economic self-interest, and they weren't willing to tolerate that. So the government is overthrown, and the United States has a law which says that you can't give military assistance to a country which has suffered from a military coup. And for a while, the Obama administration was saying, it's not a military coup unless we say it's a military coup. Uh, so I think we would be better, or certainly the US is caught in this situation in which we have, I think, genuine democratic aspirations which pervade the political class in Washington and creates a situation in which we try to implement policies which are completely unrealistic. But I think the issue in Egypt is, all right, if you go back to a totally repressive regime, you might end up in the same situation that you had with Mubarak or something worse. So you need political judgment. There was a World Bank World Development Report in 2011 that said, what you need is good enough inclusion. And that actually makes sense to me. And that does require political judgment. It does mean that you have to understand the local environment. But it doesn't mean that you're saying, we're going to put this country on the path um, to consolidate a democracy. It's possible that you're never going to get effective security. And I've laid out there what seemed to me a next best and a third best option. These are really unattractive. And policymakers in the United States or North America and Western Europe do not like these things. But the idea that maybe the best we could do is support a balance of power among warlords, or maybe just hang around off the coast of whatever country, this would mainly be the US, and rocket anybody <laughs> that looks like they're threatening the West. In some situations, that might be the best that we could, op that we could hope for.
All right, second thing that I think we can hope for is tolerance, but not inclusivity. Uh, so I can't resist, since Gerhard mentioned it, the opportunity to talk about the Peace of Westphalia. So the Peace of Westphalia is generally regarded as the beginning of the modern state system. If you'll excuse me for a non-technical term, this is complete crap. <laughs> um, so why do people think this? Um, they think it because... <laughs> people should read the treaties. They're there, translated into any language that you want. <laughs> so the two treaties that comprise the Peace of Westphalia, the Treaty of Osnabrück and Munster, they have very extensive discussions of religious toleration in the Holy Roman Empire. They required that religious issues be decided by Catholics and Protestants voting separately in the courts and the diet of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, it's pretty evident why this happened. And they froze religious practices in place um, on January 1st, 1624. Why did this happen? If you, were a European, if you were a European ruler in Europe in the middle of the 17th century and you're seeing millions of people killed in religious conflicts, you would have thought, wow, I can't manage this. This is really too difficult. Um, so what are your options? So one option was to do what the French did, was to, which was to kick the Protestants out, which is why the watch industry ended up in Switzerland, um, and why Gendarme marked is Gendarme marked, which you all know. Um, it wasn't such a smart idea. I mean, the other thing is to you introduce religious toleration. Uh, so you basically freeze things in, in place. It's not true that rulers could set the religion of their country. No, no, no. I mean, it's true that that was there in the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. No, they couldn't do that. Once something was in place, they couldn't change it because changing it was way too messy. And this idea of non-intervention in the internal affairs of other states is first articulated, as Gerhard said, by Vettel, uh, more than 100 years later. So tolerance is the way you actually got to some sort of reasonable outcome in Europe, and maybe that's what we should think of. But let's not think in Afghanistan or Egypt or Iraq or wherever that everybody's going to be treated exactly the same. Let's try and have a situation where you don't have gross violations of individual rights. Um, you know, and the, the alternative to tolerance in some places is, is repression and exclusion, if you want to kill the independent peasantry and you're a powerful enough state, Stalin certainly showed that you were able to do that. And finally, um, you can think about it. You can have some improvement in health. Um, and because I think health is an area which, in general, political leaders are willing to accept, although there have been protests against polio vaccinations in northern Nigeria and Pakistan. But all over the world, health is a big, big success story in the, in the post-World War II world. Life expectancy has gone up like 30 years, basically in almost all countries in the world, except countries that have suffered dramatically from AIDS. So life expectancy in Bangladesh now, a very poor country, is 68 years. That's really impressive. Your kids don't, all, you know, half or more of your kids don't always die in the first year of life. So there are certainly, so you can have some improvements in health services. You can have some improvements in economic growth. But I think here you have to recognize that if you're dealing with closed access exclusive orders, you can put in place policies designed to enhance economic growth, but only if they're compatible with the self-interest of political elites. And that means you're going to have to accept some level of corruption. It means you're not going to have rule of law applying to everyone in the country, but you may have some opportunities to improve economic growth in ways that would make things better for people living in those countries and, and people living elsewhere as well. All right, so let me just skip this. And, and so, but there are things that you should avoid. Avoid free and fair elections in poor countries, big mistake. Guys are not going to let themselves be voted out of office. If being voted out of office means you go into exile, you're killed, or you lose all your money. That is not going to happen. Think about elections as mechanism for ratifying agreements among political elites. What happened in Afghanistan and Kenya is not so attractive, but it's better than thinking we're just going to have a free and fair election in which the majority of the people who were running the country before are going to go quietly into the night if they lose. Don't think that you're going to be able to eliminate all forms of corruption. You will not be able to do that. Try and get rid of corruption that's so crippling 
that it crushes any opportunity for economic development. So the Kabul Bank example, where I remember once I was in Afghanistan in 2011, and I'm not, as you can probably see, you know, so learned in terms of sartorial excellence. But we had a meeting with, with Karzai's national security advisor, and he had the nicest suit I've ever seen. And this was right after there were all these stories about how much money he'd gotten from the Iranians. So you can get rid of, a, you can get rid of corruption, some forms are, you're not going to be able to get rid of all of it. So avoid these things and hope for long-term economic growth, a larger middle class, and some vindication of modernization theory. But those are way more modest objectives than most policymakers in the Western world are willing to accept at this point in time. All right, so we have, I'm sure we have some time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's, I'm happy to do that. All right, let's drink. Way in the, yes, way in the back. I think uh, attorney at law Berlin, um, if we widen the window that you put forward, uh, let's say a thousand years in the past or something, what happens to those theories? Do they still apply fully or does the whole concept even fail, in, especially when we take into consideration perhaps environmental disastrous situations, super volcanoes and their impact on societies and the, their ability to stabilize and have anything to deliver to their people? Does this play a big role in the statehood or the nation building issue as well? Um, so let me say, I mean, going back, so what's a, the big change in human society is settled agriculture in, in the Fertile Crescent. Um, and so that allowed you to get higher levels of income with effective political order, but pretty repressive regimes, and not much happens, you know, for the next 10,000 years. All right, what happens going forward? This is a great question. So I would say that I'm resting a lot of this argument on this rational choice institutionalist perspective. And if you look at what I think are the two most important books that have been written along these lines um, in the last five years, 10 years, um, one is the Asimoglu and Robinson book, and the other is a book by North Wallace and Weingast. In both cases, I do have to say, once you get to this consolidated democracy, it's nirvana. You know, this is a world in which you have open access order, everybody can form an organization, everybody has access to the rule of law. The government isn't able to repress technological change, um, so dramatic creative destruction can take place, Silicon Valley being an example of this. You know, I think what we're looking at now, and we're seeing this certainly in the United States and in Europe is, well, maybe not, you know? I mean, we've had this dramatic and, and quite technologically dynamic change taking place over the last, you know, say 20 years or so. Um, some parts of the population have benefited from this a lot. I sat down and thought like, yeah, for me, this has been like a totally great thing. Um, but there are large parts of the population, I mean, and certainly you see this in Trump supporters in the US, and in, um, you know, to some, it's not, this is not the whole base of support, but in AF Day or, Le Pen supporters, the UKIP supporters in, in, in other part in Europe. So I don't I the argument here is that this is pretty stable, but maybe not. I, I have to say, I think on the I have nothing to say about the environmental issues except my own opinion here. I think this is a way exaggerated issue in terms of modern industrialized societies. Look, downtown Manhattan flooded. There are a lot of really rich, powerful people there. And you know what's happened? Nothing. Why? Because you have some technological competence to deal with this stuff. Uh, all right, Gerhard and I, okay, we're living up high enough so that when, the, you know, if the water level goes up, we're not going to be flooded out, but, you know, people will move. You know, so I don't see any evidence if you're dealing with advanced industrialized societies that, but look, I could, I'm just blowing smoke here, okay, because um, I'm up in the front of the room, that's what you can do. Um, that they're not going to be able to manage this. For poorer countries, this is 
de a de truly a devastating problem. All right, Rabat, go ahead and Rabat, and then I'll call the next person. I won't even say anything else. <laughs> With regard to the so-called Roman uh, climate optimum and the so forth uh, uh, climate pessimum that followed due to historic uh, terms, yeah. uh, this, does this play into those uh, theoretical issues as well, perhaps uh, the state building and state decay as well? Uh, so this is good. So I don't know the, that argument about Roman, Roman climate change. Um, so I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know. We could talk afterwards, and I could, you know. So let me. I'm not going to repeat the standard argument, but I, yeah, I don't know. But I just had this question about the emergence of the political order after the fall of the. My question is about the emergence of the political order after the fall of the Iron Curtain, and I remember many, or several of my U.S. colleagues, sort of, you know, saying, "Okay, let's just go to free market." Uh, sell all the stuff off, privatize, etc. And we have the same naivety which we saw in Afghanistan, etc. approach there. And my question would have been, what sort of advice should they have given, given the sort of lessons which you learned? Was that clear? Uh, yeah, no, no, it was very clear. And I don't have some kind of, that's also a question I haven't gotten before, and I don't have a pad answer to it. So you would have... All right, the first thing to say is, I mean, what happened in Central Eastern Europe is very, very impressive, would never have happened without the EU. So there were, there were a set of external institutions that were extremely attractive, and the extant regime is totally delegitimated. Um, the, but obviously, this didn't happen so well in Russia as it did, say, in, in, in Poland. So what I don't know, the answer, what the guidance would have been, but I don't know what this would have meant, w would have had to have been to say, look, you have to identify political actors that you can rely upon if you're thinking about moving towards a more open access, more market-oriented, more rule of law situation. And those guys might not always be so great. So, I mean, Japan, I know a little bit about. And MacArthur, I think, was wrong about, like, mostly everything, was very right about the way in which he incorporated the existing Japanese elite. So he goes to the, he basically brings the emperor into the construction of this new regime in Japan. We could have tried the emperor as a war criminal as well as we tried other, you know, Tojo or other guys as war criminals. Um, and basically takes the Ministry of Commerce and makes it the basis of the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, which was a big factor in Japanese industrial success. So the policy prescription would have been, you have to, understand the dynamics of the society that you're operating in and um, see if you can identify actors that you can work with. Look, and I have to say, this is really hard, and certainly in the U.S. The U.S. is not well prepared to do this. So you're in the Foreign Service, you get moved around every few years. Uh, the, the CIA, is the intelligence community is now changing its policies, but not dramatically, and it's very difficult to do. So I'll give you, I mean, an anecdotal story for me where... It's not expertise, but I think it shows how hard it is. So Dexter Filkins is a writer for The New Yorker. And he had an article probably a couple of years ago now about Maliki's selection as the prime minister of Iraq in 2005, very critical of the administration. But basically what he argued was, look, Maliki is just a Shia nationalist. This guy lived in Iran for like 10 years or more. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, although this is the New Yorker, so they never say this explicitly, but what kind of dopes were you guys to select this guy? You know, and I thought, you know, when I read it, you know, it's really hard to figure these things out. And maybe Maliki was the best we could have gotten. I had a conversation um, with a, actually an old colleague of mine and who, who was work, I work with at the State Department, who's now been in Washington, very smart guy, uh, uh, about a month ago, and he said, he wasn't reporting this firsthand, but secondhand, he said he knew someone who talked to Maliki, and Maliki had said this. He said, if you want to know what it's like to be humiliated, you should be an Arab living in Persia for 10 years. Completely the opposite. So this is only to say that I, being, this sort of policy prescription here says, you've got to identify political elites and people who have command over violence and see if there are members of those, of those elites that you can work with. I mean, Japan is an example. I mean, Germany is more blown up, but you're able to identify, you know, Germans, parts of the population that the Allies were able to work with effectively. And, you know, even in, 
you know, there, there are these very ambitious plans for denazification right after the war, which were shrunk down and shrunk down because you had to rely on the people who were there to make the place work. So I, the, the prescription's obvious. Implementing it, I think, is at least in the U.S., is very hard, and I think probably in other countries as well. Um, Steve. Yeah, fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, it's got my head spinning with all sorts of thoughts. So I'll try to pull a few together. I want to return to the subject of time. Um, I'm thinking of, I think it was Cho and Lai when he was asked about, what do you think of the French Revolution? And he said, it's too early to tell. Right. And, um, and then, uh, you know, being in, in Germany here for five months and, and of course, observing Europe for many years, you hear so often that, you know, the Eurozone and it's, it's going to break apart, it's going to fall apart, the, 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 the centrifugal forces of member states and the history versus a federal system is just never going to happen. And then I, I think of, you know, the young United States of America, which fought a civil war 70 years after its founding, and the issues were states' rights versus central government to, to a large extent. And I wonder if sometimes we're just not patient enough in, in thinking about how how things might play out. We, you know, we, we have a tendency to see the glass is half empty instead of thinking maybe it's half full, maybe we are making progress. I mean, there's no question that for, the, for m many women around the world, the conditions of life are better than they ever were. For, in many countries, for minorities, the conditions are better than they ever were. And it, so there's lots of things we can point to in which we can definitively say from a certain value system of human rights and, and uh, that we're, we've made progress. And yet, you can point to counterexamples where you know we're going backwards as well, um, or or at least not going forward as fast. So um, I just, you know, is there a way in these political theories to have a time horizon, and maybe some version of mo modernization theory? Though there's nothing about this is, that is inevitable. Um, you know, there's no uh, sense here that it, we are all evolving towards some, uh, you know, um, uh, what was Frank's phrasing? The end of history. Uh, but, what, but it's, yet there is something there about the time horizon, these sorts of things, I think. Isn't there not? Right. So look, I agree. I mean, if you believe in modernization theory, you know, it's, it's kind of what's still up there. You know, yeah. things are going to get better. It may take a long period of time. Um, rat choice institutionalism and is, and even probably institutional capacity, more skeptical. Things can get better, but they can also get worse. You know, if you look at Hadrian's Wall and you look at the brickwork, um, it's really impressive. And then you look at all of this sort of bricks, you know, s you know, pieces of rock pile one on top of the other that the British did for the next, you know, 1500 years. I mean, it's pretty crappy looking. So it isn't to say that things necessarily get better. Now, here's something I mean, I, I haven't worked really worked out, worked my way through yet. What is true is that per capita income is going up, you know, and there are other things that you could look at health, women's rights, which in many parts of the world are definitely, but not all places. I mean, like Afghanistan, you know, worse than they were in 1960. But things are getting, things are getting better. And, and there's certainly a, a lot of empirical support for modernization theory. So if you just get to some level, maybe you can make the jump. So I think, I think the problem is this, but I'm now expressing my own kind of where my head is in this book I'm working on. It's clear that you can get to middle income levels. The problem is, can you get past that? And the challenge to getting past that is getting to higher income levels, I think, means having technological innovation. And technological innovation is really destructive. And it's destructive of the political system, not just the economic system. So how can you have a political system that would allow technological dynamism to take place? That might be more unusual. And we might not be able to depend on that to necessarily happen in some automatic way. But I'm still trying to think my way through it. I mean, it's true that, I mean, if you kind of look at patterns of economic growth, everybody's going up slowly, kind of more or less at the same rate, with the exception of South Korea and, you know, big countries in Singapore. But I don't know whether you, the argument that we can't depend on modernization theory to take us all the way to Denmark, I think would have to rest on this idea that as long as you say China and you can rely on moving agricultural workers to cities where they're much more productive and take advantage of technology that's been generated elsewhere, you can get a big jump up in your per capita income. 
But it doesn't mean you're going to go from, be able to go from that middle income status to high income status. That's sort of where I'm thinking now. But Thanks. When you mentioned technology and innovation, which you hadn't, maybe you're doing in the book, talked about as much in your lecture. You can't do everything. But do you think there's an argument that democracy and technological innovation are related uh, in some way? And, you know, if so, how? And then you didn't seem to credit ideas as much as some people do. I mean, I mean, this gentleman mentioned the Civil War. It wasn't about state rights, it was about slavery. Um, and it was a big deal that Lincoln won in terms of the whole world. I mean, it was a statement for the whole world that you could have a democratic country that was going to abolish slavery, and that had a global effect. So there's this, you know, I don't want to go back to Marx's global theories, but it seems to me there is something in the idea of democracy, and that if you have a lot of technological change, you handle it better in a relative democratic country. I mean, what's the, the big problem in China is they're getting rich, they have technological change, that system doesn't handle it now very well. And you can make an argument that the reason the Soviet Union fell apart is because that system went a certain way with the old style industrialization. It couldn't handle the computer, the internet, Xerox. I mean, the system just wouldn't function with that level of technology, so it had to change. Yeah, so I mean, on your first question, relationship between technology and, and democracy, the argument that you made is exactly the argument that's there in the literature. And, and I think that, you know, if you want a factoid piece of evidence, it's think about the Chinese treasure fleet. It's there. You know, the technology is there. China is more advanced. Why do you never get an industrial revolution in China? Because you could kind of see that once you had an industrial revolution, what happens is what actually did happen in China for 150 years, which is that the whole systems turn completely upside down. On ideas, I have to say, I could say something, but even, you know, I'm, you can see I'm not that timid, but, you know, American social science stinks on this question of ideas and their consequences. And I have nothing intelligent to say. I think they matter. I don't understand how it works in a systematic way. How about the global way? So... Global, think global history for a moment. The... So here's what I'm, you know, there is an, or, so one, one example of this argument would be that democracy is out there as an idea and we can't frustrate it. You know what I think, I'm skeptical of that because I think that you, you can have the words are out there, but they can be manipulated and used in a variety of different ways. So I mean, what you have to say is, I mean, these ideas, ideas, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry, yeah, go, yeah. Okay. So, it, World War II, okay, you had a lot of really bad guys, right? It looked like they were going to win. Now, why did England hold out, allow us to come into the war, and change the course yeah. of human history? Yeah. Now, you could argue there was something about the culture, the ideas, the strength of Great Britain that allowed them to do it, and there was something about you know, our democratic system allowed us to come together. I mean, I, somehow I, yeah, it had so, to have some right. effect. Yeah, oh, I, look, I don't disagree. So here's the, the, the kind of rational choice institutionalist argument is democracies don't lose wars. Why? Because if you're an autocratic state and you can exercise arbitrary power and you're someone living in those states, look, you know that the state can come in at any moment and grab your stuff. So either you're not going to make investments in the first place or if you do make investments, you're going to you know, turn it into gold or diamonds and hide it someplace so you can get it out of the country and flee. So that you have an autocratic regime like the Soviet regime, it's never going to make it. It's never going to make it because you can get so far borrowing stuff, but you're never going to get people that are technologically innovative. This was an, another New Yorker story. Um, uh, most of you are too old, but some of you are not too old. The guy who developed Chat Roulette, uh, which is a program, apparently a little bit racier than most online programs. 
uh, lived in Moscow, and he developed his program as an adolescent, and he tried to actually monetize it when he was in Russia, and he's ended up like where everybody else ends up now in Palo Alto. So I think there, the argument, um, you, so if you think about the democracy, I mean, the, the argument about the democracies would be that, and this doesn't work very well, I have to say, for Germany, which is a very effective state in terms of military capacity. But the argument is that by having a state which is self-constrained, the state is actually able to raise money and tax people more effectively. And that certainly works if you're looking at France and Britain in the 18th century, where you have basically this hundred years, this long war between the French and the British. France is a bigger country with more wealth and more population and ultimately loses um, in, in the Napoleonic Wars because the British are able to raise money at much lower rates of interest, to take one concrete example, than the French. All right, but if you look at the, I mean, the World War II example, so this, here's, I mean, here's where the happenstance stuff, I think, really matters and where there's no, I don't think there's a systematic argument. I mean, in 1923, how many people in Germany do you think would have predicted that Hitler would be ch chancellor in 10 years? You know, ditto, you know, in, you know, 2005, how many people would have predicted that Trump has a chance to be president of the U.S.? There were all kinds of random stuff that happens that, you know, that we have these outcomes. You know, what if, you know, what if the Japanese, you know, the Japanese knew when they attacked Pearl Harbor that, that if they actually got into a war with the United States, um, and, and Yamamoto is explicitly aware of this because he's a naval attache in Washington, that they're going to lose because they don't have, the, their industrial capacity is 10% that of the U.S. But they're hoping that by attacking Pearl Harbor, they're going to so damage American psychology that the U.S. will just give up. Well, you know, let's say that they'd adopted some other strategy, you know, and where, I mean, Roosevelt wants to enter into the war but isn't able to bring the country along until the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and Hitler declares war in the United States. So... That's the happenstance part. Now, I, I don't want to say that the ideas don't matter. They do, but I, I, I know I have nothing interesting to say about that. I mean, I have nothing useful to say. I think they matter. I, don't, I just don't know how. Gerhard. <clears throat> Steve, uh, t t have a bold idea and think you were the head of policy planning at the State Department. And so my, my question is, what follows, really, in terms of capa our capacity to influence developments in different countries? And take uh, your uh, rational choice perspective, to which, I, of course, you are leaning. Uh, and you are saying, well, one thing very important is identify the elites and be tolerant of them to some extent. We have made a mess of that in every single yeah. case. Uh, Iraq, Libya, and so on. Indeed, we don't even remotely have the capacity to identify the elites that might do the job we would like them to do. Say a little more about that. Yeah, so this is very, you know, if you're actually thinking about implement, so I, okay, so I have a clear set of ideas here, right or wrong. Um, you know, so I'm involved in some stuff in Washington still, and you can see how resistant people are to this set of ideas. They still want some notion that we're going to get these countries on the path to Denmark. Um, there are policy prescriptions that would follow, but I, I admit they're very hard. So I'll give you, I was just in a discussion in Washington last week about exactly this. So people who think about this, I mean, recognize that we have very limited capacity to understand the countries that we're operating in. So what do you do about that? So one proposal at this meeting, which had some very seasoned people that had been in the US government for a long time, was you want to develop a, a fusion cell that would bring people from, say, state DOD and the intelligence community together um, to look at these poorly functioning places. And then someone at this meeting said, we know what's going to happen if you do that. It will just get you know, basically sidelined and crushed. And, and in fact, the State Department tried to do this. They had an organization um, that was first called, um, uh, that was called SCRS, which was in the Secretary's office, and then CSO, which was Post-Conflict Stabilization Operations, which is actually there as a bureau now, has never gotten any funding. 
But someone at the meeting who I have a lot of respect for and understands how Washington works said, no, you can't just have a fusion cell. You have to have the fusion cell. The fusion cell has to develop policies. And the policies have to be presented at principals meetings, say, once every quarter. So you needed to find some action forcing mechanism. So it's true that actually implementing these things is really, in, in, the, in fine grain, is very is difficult. Now, I would say, though, writ large, I mean, I do think a policy prescription that follows from good enough governance is think contracts. Don't think you're going to go and persuade. I mean, I, you know, one of my more bizarre moments in government was I once had a one on one discussion with President Musharraf when he was, well, Musharraf, when he was president of Pakistan. And I'm sitting there talking about separation of powers in this very nice lawyer. And I'm t this is whacked. You could see that this was whacked. Um, so think about, you know, think about contracts. And we do have a lot of, but don't think that they're magical or that they're going to get you on the path to Denmark. So I think bilateral investment treaties are, they have been pretty effective in increasing investment and their mechanisms for dealing with the absence of rule of law in these countries because disputes have to be decided in international arbitral courts. And sometimes, and I'm going to do some work on this actually when I get back to Stanford with a colleague, um, there's an organization called CISIC in Guatemala, um, which is something like a, it's a it's an investigatory unit that was set up as a result of agreements between the Guatemalan government and the Secretary General of the United Nations, not not the UN, um, not the Security Council. And they actually just forced the president of Guatemala to resign. Well, and you know, if the guy had thought, known that this was going to happen, he never would have done it. So I do think that thinking contracts is something that you can do. Think about identifying partners who you will be willing to sign agreements with you. That at least is a, a practical thing, which doesn't you know, necessarily require fine-grained knowledge. But I think the fine-grained knowledge problem is a huge problem, at least in the US, for sure. Maybe it may be less. I once asked, actually, I, I'll actually say this name because I thought it was such a good answer. If you're in the U.S. government, I would say intelligence, the, the products that come from the intelligence community are surprisingly bad. And I, if any of you are there think this is wrong, you should say so. But I, So I asked a bunch of people like this, and one of the people I asked was Volker Perthes, who's head of Stiftung for Wissenschaft und Politik. And he said, yeah, you know, the problem is if you're an American, you can always get to see the head of state. Even like me, head of policy planning, which is like a third level down job, could talk to the president of Pakistan. All right, I couldn't have gotten to see Merkel, but you could get pretty high. And you always think you can go in there and persuade these people to do something like they don't understand their own self-interest. Even if you're Germany, which is a very big country, you have to have some understanding of the environment that you're operating in. So other countries might actually be more competent at this than the US is. Thank you, Steve. I think uh, we will wake up now. Thanks.